discussion we're going to talk about today is industrialization. There is a connection between industrialization and the Enlightenment. Okay? In fact, I would argue that the reason why England becomes the birthplace of industrialization and industrialization does not come around until 1790s. We'll, we'll explain what it is. We'll give you the definition. The reason why England is the birthplace of industrialization is that England had already done the constitutional revolution between 1600 and 1688. So that this constitutionalism leads to industrialization. But it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. We'll talk about this today. It's one of our main focus. Once you become industrialized, what do you be begin to demand? Again, if you don't have a definition, I'll just give you a quick definition. Definition means that you have fewer people making things by hand, more things being made by machines, which means most of the people are working in jobs Set hours, set wages. You have money. Not a lot. You're not wealthy, right? But you have money. So you don't have to be making and buying things in order to get money. If you are a peasant in the Middle Ages, how much money do you have? You don't have money, but how much money do you need? You don't need money because you're there on this guy's thing. You do the farm, you give him a cut of it. You, you, it's just an exchange, more of a barter exchange. Once you get urbanized, you're living in a city, you have to have money to be buying. That, that means that you could be poor, but what's the positive side? What's the good side? You have more jobs and you have more money, then how willing are you to accept all these old-fashioned expectations of these hierarchies? I'm going to give you this thought here. Industrialization then promotes constitutionalism. I'm going to tell you, your textbooks are not going to make this link. Part of it is that they like to do things in one period of time. They don't like to see big picture ideas. Part of it is a lot of these guys don't like industrialization. I don't need to get into explaining why, but they don't. And so when you talk about industrialization, the rise of factories, you're going to talk about how everybody is miserable. But when you read these sections, what I want you to be looking for is, okay, they say that they're miserable. What are they always crying for? More votes. Why weren't they crying for votes 200 years earlier? Because they didn't have any money. They could actually consider themselves the voting. Who all? If you're a poop scooper, you really are a poop scooper, right? And your dad's been a poop scooper, and your grandpa was a poop scooper, because you're in the, the uh, estate. You're the peasant on the, the landed estate, right? That's your job. And in fact, you're kind of honored that you have that position. Do you think about how much money you're missing? No. Do you think about all the rights and the freedoms you're missing? No. Because you're just there on the land of the state. It's not until you leave that land of the state, you start living on your own, paying for your own stuff, then you start thinking, I work really hard, I should have these results. Industrialization does bring out the prospect of poverty, but it also brings out the prospect of greater independence. And independence is a really close word to freedom. Okay, you got the point. What order is this in? It's actually right in order. This is exactly in order. It's exactly in order, okay? And there is a causal connection that you, you should get here. The, I don't have it here. The agricultural revolution is actually pretty early. We're looking at 1100s to 1200s. It is one of the causes that kind of helps to bring in Renaissance, the rebirth. Now, this is an agricultural revolution that's not just affecting England, but also Europe. 
it's, it's, it's coinciding at the same time with a trade revolution, mostly in lower in uh, Europe. You're trading more goods, you have this agricultural revolution. These two things are both encouraging the uh, uh, greater resources, and greater resources then mean you have more people, which means that you have more trade goods. Both of these are coming off of it, which also means that you actually have more money. All of this comes off the agricultural revolution, which indirectly, if you put it all down, it also means that you have more, I don't even know if I could say leisure time, but I will, I'll say more leisure time. Now, I'm not actually meaning leisure like you're sitting around playing video games. You're sitting around doing what? Thinking, coming up with ideas. That's from this is where you're going to get the scientific revolution. Now, the scientific revolution is not an over overnight thing. You can look at this, I would say, somewhere between 1450. And I would say uh, it's no longer a revolution by the 1650s. In other words, by this time, everybody is, is following it. The scientific revolution, I'm going to explain this very specifically in a second. We are looking at 14 to around Isaac Newton. He, by the time Isaac Newton is there, we are into sciences. Right? You guys all know this from just knowing Newtonian physics. From the scientific revolution, we get the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment... Again, I will define this specifically. We're looking at roughly 1650s to around 1800s. 1650s, because many of the ideals of the Enlightenment are there in England with the Petition of Rights in 1621. Certainly are there with the Second, uh, with the Glorious Revolution, 1688. John Locke. Absolutely there. John Locke, then Voltaire. Then you got these French guys, the French Enlightenment people in the 1750s. Then you've got Thomas Jefferson and the American Revolution. Then you've got the French Revolution. So this is the sequence of events. You can't get this application of scientific principles unless you have the scientific revolution. You can't get the scientific revolution unless you've just got more people and more resources. That's causal connection. Let me make sure you have some definitions here. This is where it's the ideas that we're working on. Okay? So let's make sure that you get this. First of all, definition of enlightenment. It's a movement. So it's a movement. It's an intellectual thing. It's a movement of ideas. Okay? A movement that applied scientific methodology to solve social problems. That's an easy definition. It doesn't mean very much unless you understand what scientific methodology is. So I give you a definition for scientific methodology. It's using inductive reasoning to solve natural problems. Inductive instead of deductive. Here we have a problem, and I'm not spending a lot of time on this because we have other things to discuss, but you've got to understand Two different types of reasoning. 